You got some great teeth. Not even a check. Two. What are you guys talking about? For five months, I was complaining. Why did COVID happen? Why did I lose my job? Why am I not working? Why this? Why that? Now I see. It's the thing that showed me why nobody like stuck around. You make me live it by telling the story. When you're when you're really virile, you 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 make me live it by telling the story. I think it's the Jaeger. It's early too. <laughs> I already worked out once today. With yes. Gay, Paulie yes, Gay. Look at the little belly shirt on this piece. <laughs> you want to know what that part is? You got to check out the interview with Alicia and Paulie and Nikki and myself because we did a great interview with these guys. Conversation, not really interview, picking each other's brains, getting to know each other, and they were willing to put their life on display with their marriage and things like that. And you'll hear the Paulie Gay in the belly shirt story right there in the front. Yeah. So it's That's right here on the YouTube channel. I remember telling her like, hey, by the way, in two weeks, I'm moving to California. We've been together 20 years. Like, why should we? There's nothing, off, There's the nothing off the table. Give me the most awkward moment and I'll spearhead that shit. Yeah. Because like, if you would have told me, here's what I need, I would put that above everything else. And for you not to do that makes me feel like I'm not important. God, don't let a week go by. <laughs> a week? That's the After Dark series. We can bless the After Dark. <laughs> Okay, there's no one in this world that will ever make me feel more valid. Even on my downest days, like he just makes me feel like the most amazing, beautiful thing in this world. That was such a great time. Such a great yeah. time. Glad yep. we got to do that. So that's, we, we lined up a time for, for us to get together and talk as, as dads and husbands and married men who, who have different roles and professions and all these other things. And so, Paulie, besides, I'm going to give a couple bullet points and just do a quick, you know, let's like a briefer than our, we probably took a 45 minute breaking the ice session on our first conversation. But <laughs> so on this one, just uh, whatever, if you want to expand on something about the family, but essentially, Paulie's a guy who's been married or, or together with his wife over 20 years. They've been married yep. over a decade, over 11, I believe. Yep. And so, you know, we, we relate to that time frame because that means you were basically a kid when it all started and so was Nikki and I and mm -hmm. so that's that two girls five and three I'll let you talk about them Ariana and Stasi is that correct and I have yep. to, I always want to say them right because th these are Greek names correct yeah yeah so Ariana is a Greek yeah, name right. and then Anastasia is how you say it in Greek but we call her Stasi for short because no one can say Anastasia or you say Anastasia I guess would be the Anastasia way to would be, yeah and I still said it wrong Anastasia right yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, no, you hit the nail on the head, dude. Um, been together with uh, the wife. So we, about 20 years or so. And uh, we've been married for 11, uh, two daughters, three and five, and been through anything and everything, especially when you meet that young, go through growing pains together because you got to grow as individuals. You got to grow as a couple. And, yeah. and uh, what am I, 41 now? 41. And, uh, I love my life, dude. It's great. Right Not to say it doesn't come with struggle sometimes, but yep. I, fucking, I love it. Love my life. Yeah, it's it's funny. A lot of times, you know, guys like us, we sit here and it's I don't I think we're more and more rare where the family guy is is truly a relevant segment of society. Mm -hmm. I don't know if, mm -hmm. I don't know what that came to mind to say, but that's how it feels. And you just don't see it anywhere or or you don't see it everywhere. And if you do, usually it's, you know, I don't know. And, and, you know, and I've been there too, man, where you put on the front for the public and then, you know, you're hollering and elbowing little kids in the jaw as soon as you get behind the house, closed doors or you're getting them in the car. And it's not really real. Sure. And, uh, you know, that's, that's why we're having conversations, getting to know each other, you know, even how you're helping with freaking blessed and, and giving the feedback and, and frankly, like offering consulting ideas you know like <laughs> does th that stuff matching up and that's a big part of what we stand for yeah and so uh no i think it's really cool and at the same time i think you understand that you don't like when i say i love my life to someone or dude things are so good or or whatever there's almost this thing where 
you feel the need to, why do we feel, I'm going to ask you this. There you go. Here's okay. our first question. Why do you yeah. feel the need if you do? Cause I do to almost give a disclaimer or an explanation that it's not perfect. Why do we have to throw that on the end? Well, no, because you did. That's why I totally it came to my did. Mind, and I, I do it. I totally did. And I think here's the reason why I think because we live in this world that's so dominated by social media and putting up a front to everything, right? Like people live behind a screen these days, whether it's by phone, by computer or whatever. And you always want to put your best foot forward. So I got live caught up in that. Screen. Yeah. I got caught up with that. Like, you know what I mean? Like meeting new people when you're younger and like you exaggerate about what you do or how much money you make or this or that. Cause you all, you always want to be, you know, the, the top dog or whatever it is yep. for me. Now I have more of, I place more value in not only telling the truth, but being able to help people realize like, dude, it's, it's okay. It doesn't matter where you're at in life or whatever. Better to be like front and honest about it. So like people, people see my life on Facebook and whatever. Right. And I post the good and the bad, the ugly, most of it. I don't air out all our dirty laundry, but it was like, Oh man, your life is so great or whatever. But it's not to say it doesn't come with its own hiccups. Like everybody has their own issues and it's okay to have those and be it. Not only is it okay to have them, it's even better to be able to talk about them. That's why I'm glad. Like when you start your freaking blessed community, like, and ask me to be a part of it. Like, dude, are you kidding me? Like, this is perfect. This is what, this is what the world needs. The world needs to be able to see through the bullshit, have a group where you can go and feel okay talking about your issues, your problems, whatever the case may be without any judgment because yeah. everybody goes through shit. You know what I mean? Yeah. So that's why I give a disclaimer because to me, I feel like I can help alleviate a person's anxiety or whatever <clears throat> by, by saying that. Like my life is perfect, but that's not to say it's perfect all the time. So it's an empathy piece. It's a piece to connect to Absolutely. somebody who's listening. And when we say things like, man, dude, my life is so, it's, it's so great where it is. Cause if you just stop there, the person who's more insecure based on, you know, the image stuff, the, the, yep. the false perceptions, the insecurities, that's the person who is pretty much like feeling yeah. discouraged that they can't have that. Yeah. You're, you're totally right. You're totally right. And I never want to make anybody feel like that. You know, like, it's just not me as a person. I, I want people to feel comfortable. I want people to feel good. Like I walk up to people and like, you know, I'm the kind of guy that says, Hey, hello, how are you doing? Make them smile or whatever. Did you stand up for little kids when you were young? If, if they were getting name called or, or <sighs> no, no, I was the complete opposite when I was younger. I think you that's were the bully. What, oh yeah. I that's why. That that's why I'm where I'm at now because I've been on the other side and like I did all the picking on and whatever. And it was because it brought me attention. It took yeah. any negative spotlight away from me because I was directing it to someone else. But then you realize like you're hurting these people and whatever else. So I now I go out of my way. I can't tell you, dude, like if it was up to me, I'd be ordained a saint, but <laughs> there's plenty of things that I do to make me not a saint but I'm saying like, I go out of my way to help people, to make people feel good. Like I want people to be comfortable and bet your ass. Like if I see any bullying going on now, Oh dude, I'm, I'm right inside of it. If my business or not, because the world needs, the world doesn't need that. You know what I mean? The world needs love and, you know, caring and, you know, right. human connection. But yeah. yeah, that's where I'm at now. I'm on, on the good side. I've been to the dark side. Not fun, but it made me who I am. It made me who I am. A lot of times I picture people who are younger and if they're more aggressive or they're the bully type, cause I was not like that at all. <clears throat> mm -hmm. It probably, it was built in that I couldn't be by default. Cause I was always so small, always just undersized for the age, you know, late bloomer. Okay. I would see kids get picked on and it always bothered me. And I, sometimes I would say something and sometimes I wouldn't, but if I did, it was like, I was always on the borderline of totally freaked out, scared, and wanting to be freaking He-Man. Yeah, word. sure. And, you know, I know that was a big part of why I joined the military, and it's just a huge part of who I am, man. Even these days, like when I, it's like, when I go out, 
I'm constantly scanning for somebody who's a danger to society. Really? It's constantly. in your blood. It's in your blood like that, huh? In, big time. Like I have, I've had to look at, look at, look at my path. All these choices I've taken. It was like, it always had to do with with crushing evil, and lifting someone. Mm-hmm. And like, but on the front line of it, do you know of the the Marine Colonel Grossman? No. He made this little parable. It's a, it's like a one page story, but he he talks about the parable of essentially sheep, wolves, and sheep dogs. Mm-hmm. So the sheep, it's the sheep are the people, who are just general society, civilians. Wolves are people who are evil, people who are driven by darkness, who are bad, right? They're, these are, we're talking bad people. Mm-hmm. There's liars and there's unethical people, but they're probably just dirt bags. There's evil people, sheep, wolves, and sheep dogs. The sheep society, wolves, bad people, sheep dogs, the protectors. And here's the, the big, here's the big, here's why sheep dogs get a lot of crap. Because they're canines, like the wolf. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. They're dogs. They are fierce, and they were born to fight, hunt, and protect. The difference is sheep dogs have to sometimes that they're they're the good hearted. They're there to fight and defeat the wolf, but their potential for violence is huge. It's huge, and I know mine is. I kn- I knew it from my hockey days when I would. I would do some things sometimes that I probably shouldn't have done on the ice, like in fights, like try to stick my finger in a guy's eye socket. I never knew you played hockey. Yeah. Yeah. That was my, that was my number one thing. Dude, I played hockey for a big part of my life. I know exactly what you mean. Yeah. So that was there. Like, and another thing about it is that the sheep dogs, sometimes the sheep will get out of the pen or get out of line or they're getting rowdy with the other sheep and a sheep dog has to come in. And sometimes nip an ankle. This is real. Do I sound like I, I have a farm? <laughs> do I sound like a shepherd? But like they, they do, right? Like I, that's the, the point of the story. I, we could have read the story way faster than how I'm explaining it. Yeah, but I'm following you a lot better than probably had I read the story. More entertaining, I'm sure. So that's the deal, right? And sometimes a sheepdog barks and it looks like a wolf and it's scary and it can bite and, and it kind of stays on its own. It doesn't hang out with the sheep. So is it too good for the sheep? These are the thoughts, right? Like, so sheep, wolves, sheepdogs, that's the point. I, 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 when I read that for the first time, it was probably 10 years ago or more, I knew immediately that that was me. It mm-hmm. explained so many things about my personality. Why do I love people, but I really don't like them that much? And when I say people, I speak as group, crowd think, group think, like as wholes. Because individually, dude, it's very rare I meet somebody I don't like. Mm-hmm. Individually. It taught me a lot about myself. And it, it's taken a long time to make that a part of who I am because a lot of the frustration that I've dealt with, even after coming home and, and the army was all done and all that stuff, uh, it had to do with, why can't you see? I'm just trying to help you. Yeah. Yeah. You know yeah. I mean? yeah. Like, yeah. I get it. When that stuff pops up, especially after Afghanistan, it comes up in a way that if you don't understand, I mean, cause we just finally started understanding a couple of years ago, but if you don't understand and you've never seen me go into mode now where I think somebody's at threat or a kid might be ran over by somebody like, but my trigger is faster or it's, it's more, my escalation is more severe. Uh-huh, uh-huh. My trigger is actually, I, it's gotten slower than it's ever been since I came home. Like, okay. Eight, that totally eight, makes sense. That totally yeah. makes but sense. The escalation is something that happens that's new to me too. And it goes to the point where I've had to learn how to stay in control. Yeah. Bringing it all back in. That was in me since I was a little kid being bothered that somebody was getting picked on or put gum in her hair or, you know, on the bus, these kind of things. But I think that's my outlet was the army and then going into trauma nursing, which is more of the science side. And cause I've never been the burly dude like you. See, that's awesome. That's, it's funny how 
we're both kind of in the same ballpark, but we took different paths to get there. So I like the fact that you mentioned in the beginning when you were like, oh, I see someone get bullied, but I was afraid to say anything and whatever else. After I was the bully, then I started going down that route where I would see my friends or whoever being bullying other kids and I would try to de-escalate the situation, right? Thank you so much. Um, I would try to de-escalate the situation. Oh, shoot. <laughs> Amasita? Delivery? So you were all de- formal, too, like you didn't know her. Yeah. <laughs> oh, thank, Th- you. thank you so much. Can I get your name? <laughs> so good. Um, yeah, but I would try to de-escalate the situation because I still had that piece of shit person in me that still did the bullying or whatever, but I start coming light like hey this isn't cool you know what i mean and then fast forward to 20 30 years 40 years later now that i have kids and that stop sign story you said i cannot tell you i have a stop sign in front of my house like i cannot tell you how many people run that stop sign and i can't tell you how many times every time i'm out front like i see car like if i'm cutting the grass no joke or just outside I see cars coming up. I start getting all puffy chested and I start like, I try to look intimidating because I want them to come to peacock, a stop. Man. Yeah, dude. I totally oh peacock. I gave you that chest. Dude, I totally peacock. I gave you my teeth. <laughs> you got some great teeth. I don't know where that way. came from, dude. Big chest, Bro, big teeth. You got some great teeth. Not even a chick. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. No, yeah, absolutely, dude. I'm great. Look at that. Look at that smile. I say thank uh, you in my prayers. I, you know what? Thanks for I, the teeth, Lord. I do too. What are you guys talking about? Oh, okay, we're, I have to go. We're live. I, have to go. I need one more. Come on. One more before you go. <laughs> God, I love you so much. I'm going to give you the biggest shout outs. That's what she said. One more before you go. She's flipping me off. I'm going to make you famous, baby. Yeah, but the stop sign thing, right? And so like being the protector now. I went from being the bullier to being the protector. And it. I was on that route before I had kids. But now that I have children... They're the world to me. Like, I don't want anything to happen to them to the point where I'm almost, I don't, I'm not going to say I'm too controlling, but the environment that they're in, I want to know is safe, right? Mm -hmm. Whether it's cars driving by a stop sign, whether it's people around swearing or whatever else, not to say I don't swear in front of my kids because yeah, I drop at least six F-bombs a day in front of them, (laughs) but better not let me hear you do it because I don't know you and you're not their dad or whatever else. You know what I mean? But yeah, that's, yeah. And that's, I'm the protector now, even with my wife, like telling her to be careful when she's by herself and just things like that. It's, uh, it's different as you get older. So when you were younger, have you thought about what, like, and so from what I understand, I've always thought it was somebody who had a very rough, home life and they were taking all that anger out on other people that's what mm-hmm. i understand bullies as kids to be yeah i would agree with you there but not in my case in my case i had the most loving home i always got what i needed most of the time got what i wanted for me it was because i wasn't happy with myself i was truly not happy with myself i was how old were you when you first had that awareness you had, did you have to look back on that part, though? I had to look back on that part. Okay, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I don't know what that, kid would think of that at nine years old. Yeah, no. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> so okay. self, Some kind of fucking genius. was a bitch today. Yeah. But I really think that I'm not feeling good about myself. And Mr. Lieberman in the library. Oh. It's, I'm just deflecting. Yeah, that's some genuine self-awareness right there <laughs> for nine years old. Oh, but yeah, no, I totally had to look back on that. Probably between 16 and 19 years old, somewhere in there that I started to realize why I was doing what I was doing. I was... So you were doing from when you were small? Yes, absolutely. Um, Well, so it started by being a class clown, Mm -hmm. right? Because I wanted validation. I wanted wanted people to like me. Yeah. And started being a class clown. Then around 13, got to being a bully. Till about 16, 17 even, 
being a bully. And then, so it kind of had to do with hockey as well. So right around, so I was always good at hockey, right? Like I would always, like I'm a goalie. I was a goalie. I would always play. I would play triple A all my life. But then when I was 16 and you're playing with like 18 year olds and going on tournaments cross country, you're on the ice 29 out of 30 days a month, right? So at that point, I wanted to start smoking weed, hanging out with my friends, and I thought hockey was a burden. So long story longer, I stopped skating. My I turned to shit. Like I, I just became a degenerate. You know what I mean? Lost this is you. T- you touched on this our first talk. Really? Did I? You touched okay. it. Didn't get into it. Okay. I was a bad kid, and my parents were like, you are going to go to military school, or we're going to move the family. Two weeks after high school graduation, we moved out to Connecticut. I just turned into a degenerate, um, just started partying and hanging out, got fat. And then at 18, or right after I graduated high school, like I, it got to the point where I was in trouble with the law and all kinds of shit. And my parents were like, my dad was like, listen, dude. He's like, we're moving the family on account of you because he wanted to send me to military school. He's like, you're fucking like, I don't know who you are anymore. So anyway, uh, we moved for about a year to the East Coast, Connecticut, and then got my life back together, started working out, started going to church um, on my own, not being forced to, you know what I mean? And as I was like mentally and physically and spiritually growing is when I started to realize that's the reason I was a piece of shit because I wanted to be loved, admired and liked by everybody. So it went from being in the class clown to getting laughs to being the bully that everybody was afraid of or whatever else just to validate myself. And uh, I think that's why I am who I am now is because I've been that asshole. So now when I see that at this age, it doesn't matter who it is, whether it's kids, whether it's whatever, um, I don't like it. You know what I mean? I put an end to it. And, uh, yeah, that's why I'm more of a protector now where before I was, you know, a predator. Excuse me. Yeah. You know, where I see it these days, the most is with men toward their families. Mm. But it's not fair to say like, that's where it only happens. Because, but because that's that's mostly our world typically. I mean, I don't hang around single people that much. I don't hang around people under thirty-five very often. Mickey's got her younger girlfriends, and, I, and we're seeing you know those relationships so are in different stages. What, what what do you see that is being directed Misplaced towards family? aggression? Yeah. Yeah. Where does this stem from? Do you think somebody? It, it's probably a guy who sacrificed his soul and he's bitter about it. Mm -hmm. I mean, if I'm going to oversimplify, sure, sure. Generalize it's that's, that's what I've seen. I I, I see somebody who maybe feels like they missed out on something and that they can't have it back. So they, they talk about that and that's where life kind of stays at whatever old glory day it was. Usually it was senior year somewhere. Yeah, sure. (laughs) 20 years living with dissatisfaction with yourself. You became upset as a kid and fixed it as a kid. Essentially, you caught it still yeah. as a person who didn't know who he was yet. Yeah, absolutely. And then you see these guys who, and that's, that's what I think. And I, I feel bad for them these days, and I just keep away. Do you think some of it is because either, A, they don't know how to fix it, or they don't rec- recognize the problem, or B, they're too afraid to face that problem? I think they're blind. I think sometimes that's the majority. I think there's every now and again, there's a little tiny fraction of the pie chart that Mm -hmm. that could be accounted for where they get knocked on their shoulder while they're driving on their own to and from work. Or that maybe they, for a rare instance, they play with the kid in the backyard for a minute. And because they're so busy with, with their business or their job that like that stuff, like when that guilt, when they feel the guilt, because that will come. Like, I feel that guilt, tap on the shoulder, where are you? Yeah, the kids need time. Like, if that even comes up, because I know that I've caught it with myself in the past two where it's just like, okay, no, uh, I'm busy, I'm busy, I'm busy, I'm working, I'm working, I'm busy. Yeah. But for the person who's not, like, you have an awareness, you have part of your 
whatever's inside, we've talked about this before, where you, you have a thing where you're naturally curious and you wonder and you want to know and you want to learn and you want to see the way I see it in my experience is that most people do not have that. They don't have a desire to learn, grow and change or to become mm -hmm. a better product for those around them or the, or the family that they're in or whatever relationship. Like people don't think of themselves as products. And I don't mean to make it sound superficial or, or trite or like whatever, shallow, but I do, that is like to have, to have the desire to dig and learn and grow on yourself as a project. And I heard this from a seminar speaker a long time ago. That's probably where, why it's in my head is that now that I'm remembering this, when you learn to work on yourself, yeah. like, so you think about your priorities and goals, right? And okay. I want to have for, for guys like us, we're like, okay, well, I want to have a, a great family. I want to have a, a, you know, I want to have X, Y, Z in my family. I want a beautiful wife. I get along with great. And, and we're both attracted to each other. And, and maybe we want X amount of kids. Maybe we want no kids, whatever you define that out. But how many people sit there and literally think to themselves, who do I need to be in that picture, Ooh. in that frame that's 10 years from now, because it takes wow. time to build relationships and depth of roots. How, like, who do I need to be so that picture can actually become a reality? Wow. I will tell you this. Out of 41 years that old that I am, I've never looked at that in that perspective. I might know that I need to grow or whatever on account of me, but I've never put myself in that situation to say, here's what I want or what have you. How do I get there? How do I cultivate that? As opposed to here's what need, here's what this person needs to be. Here's what this person needs to be. Here's what this person needs to be. You yeah, know why what can't I mean? you just, why can't they just, Yes. And, and I've had, dude, I notoriously, I, that's huge right there. Selfishness is in my genes. Like we have similar personalities and a lot of crossover with that. And part of that, that sometimes I get, I think I'm situationally extroverted. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. That makes sense. That makes because sense. Most of the time, like I love this. I like being able to serve people. I like speaking in front of people. I, I like yeah. doing that in groups, but if you see the 80 to 90% of my life, that is also every bit of what I want and have to have. Most of the time, I'm just alone in this office, in this little, you know, that's it. Uh -huh. This is my office. We're outgoing people built into our personality. There's a sense that we like to show off. I got kids that like to show off what they're learning on the trampoline. Like, let me, it, it's a show off thing. And then you learn and grow through that, hopefully. But to become that product for those around us is the humble thing. That's the humility thing. And let me define how I use the word humble. There, there's the old cliche. It's not thinking of your, of less of yourself. Let me say it again. It's not thinking less of yourself. It's just thinking of yourself less. Mm, okay. Or you could say less often. Yeah. Right. But yes, when we think about ourselves as who do I need to be? So that vision can happen. So I, I can have a wife that's excited to come home. And maybe right at the door, we just get going. Mm -hmm. Like, who do I need to be so she can be that woman? And at the same time, it's a win-win. You know what? And I still struggle with that, especially when you're talking about the wife. Because, I mean, we've been together 20 years, married for 11, and there's still growth that happens every day for both of us. Um, for me, it's a lot of it is why can't you be this? Why can't you be that? Why can't you be this? And I think a lot of it is a lot of it is because we're gonna get deep, so follow me here, right? When you marry someone or you're with someone and you get these promises, like, this is who I am, this is what I'm going to do, and we lay it out, like, we're going to map together the rest of our lives, right? So I said, okay, here's what I expect, or my expectations of a wife, and here's what I would like, and then she did the same thing. So when you get these promises, like, okay, I will do this, I will do that, I will do this, and then that doesn't happen over the course of a year, three years, five years, you start getting bitter. 
that's when you start getting in the mode of like, well, why can't you be this? Why can't you be that? But at the same time, life, life is fluid. Life's not set in stone. Like this is your path. This is whatever. Absolutely. Every day things happen. So one thing I learned and I'm still learning is that you, you have to take these hurdles in stride, right? Like you have to be able to, to be fluid with the situation. I have to be a better person. So I'll give you, I'll give you an example. And I don't know how relatable this is, but this really hit me the other day. So I got laid off because of COVID April 31st or April 30th, whatever, right? The last day before May. I haven't worked since then. So thankfully I got a decent severance package and with unemployment and money that I had saved, whatever else, I haven't worked in, fuck, it's been six months. I need to get off my lazy ass, whatever. (laughs) But I was looking at, I was talking to my brother the other day and I was like, dude, this sucks. I haven't worked in this long. Now, granted, I haven't been looking or what have you, but I told I was talking to him about it and I was like, you know, this sucks that I haven't had anything, any offers that was as good as what I was doing and whatever. And he says, yeah, but look, you got to look at the bright side. He's like, look at the positive things that, excuse me, he didn't even say that. I, while I was talking about it, I realized it. And this happened yesterday, by the way, is, but at the same time, I was able to stay at home for five or six months while my wife finished the radiology program. So she didn't have to worry. And she would be able to focus on school and she was working and whatever else. So by me sacrificing who I was and what I was doing allowed her to free that up. And now I'm starting to see where the roads are coming together again to propel us to where we need to be. Does that make sense? Like I got, okay, good. Cause I got lost when I was talking about it. I was living in the moment and I totally got lost about it, but I can't tell you. And like, I thanked God the other day. So I pray every night and I like, sometimes I go through the motions. Right. But last night I humans. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's only non-human people don't, their prayer life is perfect. So usually I go through the motions, but last night, you know, I thank God and I said, thank you for letting me see this because mm. I was thank just you for so letting me see this. Yeah. Usually people like, get shown and they run the other way. Dude, I was just, it was just such an epiphany for me. And I was like, all this time I was complaining about, Oh, I got to watch the kids every day. Oh, I'm not working. Oh, I got to do this. Oh, I got to do that. But the whole time I allowed my wife to focus on her program at school to finish it she's already got a job she's making great money and now everything's starting to come together so while god or whatever is taking me down this path i was bitching about it the whole time and then as the roads are starting to merge i'm starting to see why i was going this way so the whole time for five months i was complaining and bitching why did covid happen why did i lose my job Why am I not working? Why this? Why that? Now the roads are merging. And yesterday I said, thank you for all that's happened because now I see why it happened. I mean, like, it's it's amazing, dude. Dude, Eye-opening, bro. You just, what's that? Eye-opening for me. Yes. You described it. I love the way you described it because you took me back to something that I had a realization of within the last under two weeks. Okay. Talk to me. Tell me about it. I want to hear well, it. Well, it, just the way you described it, it's a very similar situation. Okay. I like that you said deep. And if you noticed earlier, I did this. I was like, it was like a knowing sort of grin. Uh-huh. Okay. uh-huh. Good. Because I don't know, like it happened on our last talk too. I don't know if I'm going to get to share some of the things that happen and I don't itch to do it. I don't like, I'm not pulling on anything right. sure. to say it. But when it comes up and then it comes up, and then boom, I love it. Yeah. That's why, that's why freaking blessed in this podcast and the, the influence that we will have, it's because of conversations like this, where 
God, our friend, our wife, our husband shows us something. Our kids, usually our kids, they show us something and we go, no, thank you. Give me another beer, dear. Get out of the way of the TV, damn it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I know. Guilty. Been there. But I do know this. You have something. I have something. I know other people who have something that that thing inside them, when they're shown that thing, they're like, oh, give it to me. Yeah. Give it to me. You go to work on it. You're sawing on it. You, it's a project. Yep. And when the man of the house, want to be a man of the house, big guy, when he takes himself on and then instead of his wife mm -hmm. as the project to fix, the whole house can change. It's difficult because I don't know if my wife left or not. Man, females can be tough to, to manipulate and move around. And I don't mean negatively. I, you know, I, I know. Yeah. Finger in the ribs. <laughs> but no, they, they, these, some of these chicks can be tough to lead, man. Yeah. They, they can be tough to influence. And like, I'm over here going, like when you're, when you're really a virile guy, right? I'm using like sexual terms. I think it's the Jaeger. <laughs> It's early too. What time is it? What time is it in uh, Universal? Uh, 3.47 right now. I already worked out once today, so I'm good. But I don't know. If we, if, we, if we keep chit-chatting and having drinks, I don't know if I'm getting to the gym again. When we figure out what that thing is inside somebody, nine out of ten times, the people that go to these, these, the self-help seminars, like, which I'm a, I'm, they changed my life, okay? But I used them to change my life. Like people that go typically go because it, it's, it's, they get their dopamine hits and their serotonin mm -hmm. release and they get told that they're a winner when maybe they've never won or finished anything in their life. I showed up as a dude who was writing talent, bro. I was writing talent and I was 27 years old when it came along. And this was like toward the, right at the end of the, the needles, right? It was actually that environment who helped me get off of that. Like when I say help me, because they gave me a new target to be addicted to. Mm -hmm. Okay. That, and that target became the rough edges of myself. Does that make sense? Yeah. I'm following you. Yeah. So when I put things in my own thoughts, I don't know if it always translates clarity to somebody with clarity to somebody else. So I just wait a second to see if that made sense. Because in here it does. Yeah. That's why, that's why when I was telling my story, I had asked you because yep, when you're I passionate about something – you get lost telling the story. Like, I don't even know if I looked at the computer. I was just in another zone, like living the yeah. moment again. So like, but I think when you get like that, the passion, I can follow your passion. So even if I'm not familiar with what you're talking about, you make me live it by telling the story. So okay. cool. I'm good Sounds with that. Sounds cool. Never heard that before. Yeah. Like what's that thing? Because I'll tell you what it was for me. It was as simple as this. This is the thing that turned everything for me. That thought that happened back then. It was, I've messed up everything. Remember I told you the books? Yeah. The, 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 the yeah, yeah, yeah. changing life changers. Yeah. Just the few. That's right? why they're there. This might sound funny. And I don't sell books. And I don't have affiliate links. <laughs> but I'm going to show this book. Okay. Because it needs to be shown. Let's see it. It's the thing that showed me literally why I was so offensive, why I was so grating on people, obnoxious, why easy, easy, easy to make friends with charm and smile and 25 and like whatever it was, right? Yeah. But nobody like stuck around. Or nobody was ringing my phone off the hook to hang out. Nothing substantial. Nothing. Nothing. And when I read this thing, it was like the first thing I ever read, based almost everything changed. And since then, I say, I believe it's the best marriage book ever written, except for the Bible. The, the husband-wife practicality stuff, right? No sacrilege here. Uh. Hey, sorry about that. Totally forgot to mention the book name. It's How to Win Friends and Influence People. Ah, uh, by Dale Carnegie. I can't even see the bottom. Yep. Yes, I've read that. 
Yeah, I've this is the book. original copy. I do have it. It's on my bookshelf upstairs. The original one that I read a couple few times. Great book. I think the third chapter, I just looked at it recently. It's why it's in my head still. The third chapter, don't criticize, condemn, or complain. That's the title. And the whole chapter teaches you basically, as I tell my kids, how to not be a dirtbag. That book changed everything, man. And when, when I read that and I saw that in myself, we were talking about the camera views earlier, the mirroring, uh -huh, that uh -huh. book in those first three chapters, oh my gosh, just, I think the thought I had was, this is why nobody likes me. Were you doing all three or what? Remember when you said big shoulders in our first talk, put it on me, I'll handle it. I'm not gonna say yeah. to anybody, a man, does not talk about the burden. Yeah. Now, I never had that character trait. <laughs> so for me, all I did was let you know every reason I couldn't get ahead and why I didn't like something or even why I didn't like the, anything in the house. Or Now, again, I wasn't running around complaining all day long. I've always been a genu genuinely optimistic and happy person for the most part. Okay. My family life, marriage life, Lots of, lots of definitely seeing the cloudy lining or the gray lining, not the silver one. Definitely a lot of that until that book. And that was as a Jesus claiming husband, dad. So what is that thing you think? Really rare where a guy or a girl will look at themselves, man or woman will look at themselves and go, I'm the freaking problem and I'm going to change it. And I'm going to be awesome one day. I'm an awesome dad. I think you're an awesome dad. Thank you. And we're not perfect. Is it time for a refill? I would love one. This isn't even affecting the thought process yet. It's still early. I asked my wife to make me another before she left. I, I'm willing to bet it's downstairs, but she was such in a hurry to get out, she didn't even bring it up. I cannot tell you how many different times I've ran through scenarios about getting divorced. I did not have the balls to do what I wanted to do for four years. You can't rely on other things or other people to be perfect. If I keep going on those lines, I'm just going to keep fulfilling the frustration. What is immediately in front of that I can make flourish today? When we try to figure out these rough spots, then we can support each other. Why couldn't have you have done this? 10, 11 years ago. Well, that's only because you haven't let it go. And you know yeah. what? I don't know if I'll ever be able to let it go.